I want to start really by offering an apology to all of the uh, people who organised this session. As many of you will know, I've spent the last or well, first 10 years of my career banging on, often very unwelcomely and very loudly, about the need for critical engagement with archaeological digital methods and particularly 3D computer graphics. And then Having been given this wonderful opportunity to talk about this in front of a receptive audience, I choose to present a paper about something different entirely. So <laughs> I, uh, I do feel a little bit guilty about that. But um, I did choose this subject carefully, and you are the people that I wanted to um, present it in front of. It wasn't an accident that I'm here today talking about this. Um, and I hope that my reasons for choosing to talk about this today will become apparent as I present. And my presentation today is about the social and technological backdrop against which archaeology, digital archaeology, I should say, emerged, namely the um, advent of personal computing and the proliferation of personal computers um, into now almost every corner of life in, uh, in, in Europe, certainly in other places. Um, more specifically, I'm going to talk about emergent archaeological material, so the archaeological, uh, the material culture of the uh, present and contemporary past, and uh, uh, how our understandings of uh, the technology of this period can um, help to inform our understandings of contemporary archaeological practice and the way that we use computers today. So although I'm not going to be tackling archaeological method specifically, although I'll sort of reference it throughout, I hope that this might underpin some of the conversations we have today and start to sort of help us to think slightly differently about things like technological determinism and that sort of thing. Um, so while you might argue that this is a case of taking 50 steps backward in order, in order to take uh, half a step forward, I hope it's of some use to the discussion today. Um, so the... Um, project begins really with um, an argument for the need to think of uh, digital technology as a, uh, and specifically material elements of digital technology, as a form of cultural heritage. And the reason that I want to make this argument here today is because I think archaeology has something extremely unique to contribute to this process. Um, it's not new to talk about digital technologies and the use of digital technologies within a heritage setting. Um, Sarah has published on this, as have many other people. Um, but I hope what we will bring to the discussion uh, through presenting this is um, a real focus on the materiality of objects. And I'm going to draw upon archaeological theory, particularly um, contemporary approaches to the study of material culture, um, non-representational type theories and embodied use of technology and material um, to try to add something new. And I think the two sort of approaches to the study of material, oh, it's not to the study of material culture really, the two studies, uh, approaches to the study of historic computing in the past have really been based around on the one hand linear progress centric narratives which emphasise the latest developments of different periods. So we'll hear about the uh, introduction of the graphical user interface as a cataclysmic event in computing which changed everything and of course it does but there's then an afterlife there's all of the stuff that comes afterwards that's not the significant moment of the graphical user interface the significance perhaps comes from our use of it in subsequent periods and so we're going to try and tackle that a bit and the other form of um uh historical um, narrative which we get a lot around historical computing is the idea of an externalized uh, social narrative. So science and technology studies are very good at this and sociology and these are really valuable things but they give us part of the picture and what I mean by that is that we can talk about the impact of technology on gender and vice versa for example or on politics. We might talk about the, uh, where well, it goes back to the uh, Gartner hype curve, the impact which social media has had upon society and all of these things. But by talking about externalised historical narrative it can be difficult to grasp the quotidian details of everyday life. How we use computers now, how you're using computers in this room at the present, those things aren't necessarily captured by talking in terms of historical meta-narratives. And I think archaeological approaches can be used very usefully to try to overcome this uh, 
high level theory and then start to develop the theory of the heritage of computing in more of a bottom up way. So the project hasn't come from nowhere. I'm not just talking about these ideas with uh, nothing behind it. Um, the project uh, has a basis in uh, museums. Um, we've got a museum associated with the University of York called the Jim Austin Computer Collection or the Jim Austin Computer Sheds, as they're fondly known, with a picture of it up here. And we've also been working with the Science Museums Group in the UK. And what we've been trying to do effectively is to argue that we need to take a more structured approach to uh, the development of frameworks of significance for computational technology. Um, and the reason for this is that as long as our approach is to uh, associating value uh, or meaning with um, digital technologies are driven by meta-narratives, we, um, could, by definition, collect a very incomplete and subjective record. Uh, we have a record which reflects our interpretation of the significance of these objects in the present, um, rather than a record which might be of, useful to pe of use to people in the future. You have very different readings of the impact which digital technologies have on our lives, on our ways of working and living. And uh, it's not a luxurious um, subject entirely. This is really critically endangered heritage. And I've got a couple of examples in a minute. Um, and I talked about in this very spot yesterday, Victorian architecture being one of the uh, uh, perfect examples in the UK of um, an entire architectural style which was very nearly lost to us because it was undervalued. And Victorian buildings um, during the 20th century were routinely destroyed with very little protection. And the protection movement eventually uh, swept in to save um, numerous wonderful examples, fortunately, but I think we're in a very similar situation at the moment with the material culture of the early digital age. We've all got stories, having worked in universities, I'm sure, of really historically significant, as far as we're concerned, computers being found in skips, um, of uh, technology being destroyed willy-nilly with no thought to whether or not it has any value in the future. So I think we do need to think very seriously about this before these things are lost. Um, and I think we also need to think about, yeah, what we collect, but also who is collecting. So there are collectors all over the world who value this stuff, of course. I mean, and we see examples like this of uh, computers fetching ridiculous sums. And this is the sort of best example of that, really. It was sold at Christie's Auction House, a uh, Mac 1, for, and I don't know what it sold for, I think it was anonymous, but 300 to 500,000 pounds um, for this computer that's extremely rare. But of course, it's not just the rarity that gives it that value. It's the story of um, Apple, which followed it, and uh, the cachet attached to that brand. Because if we were interested in uh, uh, rarity alone, we'd have to start thinking about other kinds of computers. This isn't a very good example of that, actually, because it's not particularly rare. But the point is here that this is something which would still be considered junk, while the other one is selling for hundreds of thousands of pounds. And this is arbitrary, of course, because the Commodore PET, in Britain anyway, had far more of an impact on people's lives. It was far more of a cultural presence in British life than the uh, Apple computer, which was its uh, contemporary ever was. And so the value is, in a sense, arbitrary because it's driven by uh, market values and it's also driven by uh, connoisseurship and a collecting that's based on this arbitrary value system. And what we really wanted to do was to argue that through archaeology, we can move towards a more structured approach. Objectivity is the wrong word. It's about structure and it's about actually thinking these through things through and coordinating them. Um, I think archaeology is important because it offers counterpoint to externalized historical narrative by handling the objects themselves we are forced into um, confronting the reality of technology. How does technology enable uh, behavior? How does it constrain behavior? Conventional wisdom, oh, no, I won't get onto the case study yet. You'll be very excited though when you see what it is. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I think, yeah, archeology, span um, allows us to consider the details. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and the way we did this was to engage in a close, tactile study and use of the computer mouse. Now, it doesn't get much more exciting than that, does it? But I think the, um, 
The thing about computer mice, which is really interesting in this setting, is that within all narratives, all historical narratives that currently <coughs> exist, um, they're underrepresented because they are seen to have a very short innovation life. Um, they were invented and then they're perceived to have uh, remained largely the same, which isn't true. Um, and they are also um, undervalued in terms of their social impact, and they're also under-conceptualized in terms of the impact they have on our computing practice, although in that case there is work. In the other two areas, I don't think there's very much work at all, with one exception, which is a paper uh, published uh, in an ACM journal, which I forget the title of, by Atkinson, which did look at the social impact of mice. And I think this is one of the creepiest adverts I've ever seen. I'm not sure <laughs> quite what it is about it, but it does really emphasise the uh, social um, milieu surrounding the introduction of the mouse and the fact that it was um, it's widely now, I think, perceived to have been the point at which it became okay for men to use computers because you were no longer using a glorified typewriter but were doing something more scientific and uh, visual and tactile and all these kinds of things. And I don't profess to know a vast amount about this, but it's a very interesting uh, area. But again, we're working at the uh, meta level here. What impact did this actually have on uh, specific people's lives at specific times doing specific things? So what about the objects and what can they tell us? So I think, well, this is what we did. We, uh, we uh, went out to the Jim Austin Computer Museum and we got a selection of mice, which I'll show you in a minute. And we just started using them. And by the clay study, we were able to learn a lot about the uh, subtleties and nuances of using a mouse. This may seem ridiculous to people in the room who will have used everything from some of the first mice on sort of sun ones and things like this all the way through to the present and have had that changing experience. But that's a, the argument, really. I haven't had that experience, and so I didn't know how different they were, and that hasn't been documented. Um, but we try, chose to sort of try to break this down for no particular reason, just because it gave us a bit of a bit of a structure, and it's the first time we've really tried to do this. Uh, mice aren't the be-all and end-all of this project, but it's just the thing we started with. And we decided to study them in terms of their design and construction, to the aesthetics and the way they're actually assembled, their functionality, by which I mean sort of the affordances which they offer to the user, the restrictions that they, they, can, they uh, place upon you. And then this is perhaps the most interesting from an archaeological point of view, the modification. Have mice been modified and changed? And, you know, it sort of brings to mind the uh, studies of hand axes and things like this, this very tactile object, which is your engagement with very complex processes. How do we modify these objects in order to um, uh, tailor them to our needs and requirements? Um, so... Uh, starting with design and construction, because I think perhaps it's the, uh, the, the least relevant for us today. Although the mouse is seen as being a very static and unchanging thing, in fact it's changed enormously over time. Um, we've got very early examples of mice here and some slightly newer ones, uh, and one which is included just because it's one that I deeply love. So at the top, uh, your top left here, we've got... Um, ah, the name is completely... Uh, slipped my mind, but it was one of the uh, first commercially available mice which was developed in Switzerland and never features in any stories of the development of the computer mice because it's uh, seen as being something that emerged uh, really in Silicon Valley. And next to that, you've got the first Apple mouse, which is really significant because it's one of the first mice that became massively commercially available because of the success of Apple's graphical user interface. And that was really the thing that led to the adoption of the mouse. And then at the, the black one at the bottom is uh, a, uh, a mouse from a Sun One. And then next to it, we've got my favourite, my, my darling mouse, if, uh, if you can say such a thing, which is the uh, Logitech mouse from an Acorn Archimedes, which to British people of a certain age is uh, uh, a computer that you hold very fondly. It's the computer I learned computing on, and so it was, I couldn't resist it when I saw it. And so you can just see here, even in these mice, which all occur within 10 years of each other, there's huge stylistic change. And if you compare it today to a uh, Microsoft Magic mouse, the changes are enormous. Um, but again, not the most interesting aspect of the study, possibly, but interesting nonetheless. 
What gets more interesting is the functionality. So as I've said here, uh, the PC setup appears to have changed very little when you think about it. We have uh, the same configuration of mouse, CPU and keyboard in most offices that we've had for the past um, 25 years. But the uh, truth is that there has actually been an awful lot of change. Uh, and subtle details have changed with the functionality, which are enormous. And the thing that I've uh, chosen to try and explore this a little bit is the underside, the underbelly, the dark underbelly of the mouse. Uh, it was quite dark, actually, if you uh, take that off and see all of the grime that's in there. But the point is that when one of the core... Uh, great things. One of the core... Um, uh, that's very useful. <laughs> One of the core things about the mouse is its ability to track motion, obviously. And that is really, really central to our experience of contemporary computing. And it's become ingrained in us, and I'm going to talk about this a tiny bit more in a minute, uh, that this two-dimensional interface is more or less the be-all and end-all of computing. And you can make arguments about virtual reality. And as I said before, that's the area I do a lot of my research in. And so I'm enormously enthusiastic about virtual reality and uh, games technologies. But really, we're only just a chink in the armour. I mean, we really are talking about um, uh, computers since the introduction of the graphical user interface as having a sort of a, a two-dimensional uh, desk-based metaphor, which people like... Um, uh, Ted Nelson railed against at the time of the introduction, but these critiques were largely uh, forgotten. And the functionality of these kinds of things is really interesting. I haven't actually got the right example up here, but the black mouse, which you saw, the uh, Sun One mouse, was a mouse that only worked on a specific mouse pad. And it was horrible when we used it. You sort of you lift it a tiny amount and it jumps all over the place. You have to have the exact right pad. If the pad gets damaged, it doesn't really work. Um, and it just really wasn't very effective. And then you get these, this sort of change in design. I won't say evolution, because it's not evolving, really, because these things coexisted for huge amounts of time. Uh, early trackball there with a horrible slippery uh, ball, um, which didn't work very well on any surface unless it was a sort of a uh, purposely designed mouse pad. Then the Apple mouse in the middle, which is the mouse which probably most people in the room remember uh, or the technology you remember using with the ball, which is slightly more robust in the sense that um, you can use it on any surface. But again, it's not very um, uh, effective when we compare it to the optical mouse here, which can be used on any surface, can be used upside down, which uh, uh, the other mice can't. And um, it uh, really enables us to think slightly more in terms of operating within a 3D world. You still have a 2D environment within the computer, but we're able to sort of, uh, it embraces slightly the environment we, uh, we live in a little bit more. But then the most uh, interesting point of all, I think, is the modification. And I, uh, I think to um, the confusion of uh, Jim Austin, who we work with, became completely fixated with this mouse because it was... Um, I've got a close up here. It was a mouse that was uh, <laughs> quite you. It was a mouse that was uh, owned by um, someone who uh, ran a CAD company. Uh, this was the first mouse they'd got, and he got so frustrated by not being able to figure out which button was which while he was using it. They had a wire inserted into the middle button. And I just found that fascinating because it's so easy to think of a ubiquitous technology like the computer mouse as being entirely self-evident, whereas in fact it's far from self-evident. This takes a lot of learning, a huge amount of learning, but because it's implicit in our experience of computing these days, we just take it for granted. And I think that's where I'd really like to sort of take it back in the... Uh, conclusion here, to our experiences of archaeological method and practice, there's a need for us to be extremely critical of the hardware that we use as well as the software that we've been talking about today because it is so easy to think things are self-evident. It's so easy to think that um, a computer mouse is a seamless or um, uninvasive interface between you and a machine, but actually it has a huge amount of agency. And I mean agency in the most literal sense, because it's an agency that's communicated from an entire design process, an entire culture of thinking about computers into your hands. And it constrains you and it dictates how you can or can't use a computer. And we still haven't moved beyond, even with touchpads and other technologies, the inheritance of this two-dimensionality in this planar world. Um, 
So to conclude, I want to reassert the idea that we as archaeologists and as computer users more generally can benefit from considering digital machines as mediating actors in our practice. Do, uh, do objects have agency? In this instance, they certainly do. They constrain as much as they enable. They replicate specific patterns of practice and thought without us, unless we're critical, ever even knowing that it's going to ha it's happening. And it's only by preserving the quotidian material culture of the digital age that we'll ever really be able to understand the role of computing technology in influencing the way in which we perceive and represent the world within archaeology and elsewhere. That's all. Thank you very much.